such timely topics on leftist stuff like cultural appropriation. Okay, so under the comedy uh, category, I've got Milo, which is obvious. Milo is a British gay conservative, um, and he did a uh, university tour. And there's, he did a lot of he has a lot of big hit uh, viral videos because uh, students would protest at some of his, his uh, talks and do kind of crazy things like was it Rutgers a bunch of students uh, uh, spread paint on their faces like they'd stand up and spread paint on their faces and and uh, disrupt his event and it's just not just nutty just crazy and. I've never seen anything like that. I've been in university for quite a while, and I've never seen stuff like that. I, got, I should say, though, I was, um, some of you might know that Ann Coulter was supposed to speak at Ottawa and didn't. I was there, actually. I was, I was doing my master's at that time, and I was there. I was out front, and there was tons of people outside. And there were protesters, but I bet you there there was very few. There was probably 20 or 30 people that were making noise and saying stupid things. There was probably about eight cop cars out front. And there was a long line of people that were trying to get in. And I was in that line. And I could, we couldn't get in. The event got shut down. Uh, which is unfortunate because I just well, I was wanted to see what you had to say. Uh, and I'm sure everyone else in the event did too. And... It just makes it just reminds me that much of what the media reports on, especially to do with protests, it's a spectacle, and it's not even close to what's really the facts. Um, when they reported on this event, they made it out that there was like a huge student protest, and that most of the university was against Ann Coulter coming to speak at Ottawa. But it's just not the case. Not even probably not even a hundredth of the university student population was even there. And like I said, there was only about 20 or 30 student protesters, and there was hundreds of us outside trying to get in. So the minority, really, in this case, is the protesters. They were insignificant. But, of course, what gets the, 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 uh, the attention? Well, it's these small groups of protests. So, anyways, that's, you can't believe the stuff they say on the news often. They often will bias the story. It's just ridiculous. And, but I was there, and I the protesters were very few. And there were tons of us trying to get in, and of course we couldn't get in. So that was that. So where was I? Um, yeah, so Milo. Yeah, so he does student events, student stuff, although that's finished now. Um, I don't think he's doing them anymore. And I guess like he was certainly a Trump fan, and I just was curious. I don't think he was funded by Trump, but one of the reasons why he was doing all this stuff is because of he wanted to get Trump in, and he did get in. So he's finished that, that now, So, but I don't know what he's doing with himself now. But anyways, he's got some very good content on critiques of social justice warrior stuff. So that's all That's all very good. Uh, same with Gavin McGinnis. He's, he's, uh, um, he was born in Canada, but he's now an American. So he's an expat, I guess. Uh, but he's got some very good stuff too. He's on the Rebel Media which is a really good channel, and um, it used to be, the people who run that channel used to be Sun News on TV in Canada, but then only lasted a year or so, and then they, they stopped. They, it was funny, I remember them on, they used to be on channel like 13 or 15 or something like that, and then at some point after a few months, they became channel 143, and then that was it. So, anyways, I'll talk more about Rebel Media a little later. But anyways, Gavin McGinnis has good comedy videos, and he has himself doing stuff, and he has he also dresses up as his brother, which is not his brother; it's actually him, and he calls himself Miles McGinnis, and he, uh pretends he's a leftist, and it's really funny. He pretends he's a, a pretentious, snobbish social justice warrior and with a, you know, Che Guerrera t-shirt. It's so funny that people think he's so great. And the guy was a murderer. Same with, um, uh, what's his name, Chavez. 
there's there's in, there's people in a in a uh, political party that's the third most popular political party up here that praise uh, praise what's his name that South American used to be a South American dictator. It, it's the Chavez guy. Like it's just nuts. These people. These on the left. It's just so close to. Uh, t totalitarianism. It's awful. And the, but, the, oh, but they call it democratic socialism. It's just nonsense. It's never democratic. Um, but anyways, so Gavin McGinnis has got some good comedy stuff. Um, Stephen Crowder, also a Canadian. I think he's still in Canada. I think he's in Montreal. Um, maybe he's in the States now. But anyways, he has a good show. I don't really watch his show as much, but um, he has good content. He has good guests on. And he has some good comedy type stuff. That's his his stuff. It's basically comedy. I don't think it's as intellectual as other stuff that I've watched, other stuff that I watch. But um, it's more for comedy, and he certainly can easily make fun of people. Steven Crowder. So just in general, social justice warrior stuff is is the butt of jokes nowadays. That's the times we live in. So there's lots of that online that you can find. Okay, the information category. So one person I think is fantastic is Bill Whittle. Um, he has he used to be on PJ Media, which I guess was a conservative media. Um, I don't know if they were on TV, but they were on, certainly on YouTube. And they were they closed about a year ago, but he used to be on that show. But he has his own stuff. He has a podcast called Stratosphere Lounge, which is really good. He actually flies planes. Not for a job, it's for his hobby. Um, what his main success has been is what are called firewalls. And they are produ uh, produced YouTube content that are fantastic. And some of them have millions of views. And one of them is called Three and a Half Days, I think. And he says, he basically, his basic point is that he thinks that, that um, millennials... And some of even the Generation X, Generation Y, they live too comfortably, and comfortableness kind of breeds laziness and, and decline and decadence. And he thinks that if every year, I think, I, I'm not sure if this was for high school kids, I think probably for high school kids, every year, if you took high school kids and they had to go out to the, to the woods and live for three and a half days out in the woods, in groups, and they could choose to sit and do nothing for three and a half days and they get picked up, or they could actually forage and cut wood and burn wood for uh, some heat at night um, so they have a somewhat more comfortable existence for three and a half days. It's up to them. But he just thinks that the struggle would add some perspective to uh, people. And I think that's a good idea. And I think Nietzsche, that was one of Nietzsche's views. He thought that struggle was important for, for people, for life, that life required some resistance. Uh, people who live in affluence and live without fear and without um, struggle or success or anything like that, they decline and they're useless, right? So. There's that idea from Nietzsche of some resistance uh, breeds better character and health. You even just think of like exercising. You exercise with resistance, right? You put weights on your on the uh, bench press, or you you can even add uh, resistance to uh, uh, exercise bikes. You can increase the the tension, and so it's harder to to pedal. That is what builds muscle and strength and even psychologically as well. So anyways, Bill Whittle has some really good content on commentary, social commentary and cultural commentary. And he even, I think he might have been the only or very few people who predicted that Trump would win the election. He thought that um, Trump, he thought that the next best Republican type would come from the pop culture. And he was right about that. That wasn't Romney, that was Trump. So he's got some really good stuff. Bill Whittle is fantastic. Uh, look him up. Uh, next for information is Stefan Molyneux. A long time ago, I used to watch him when he 
would do podcasts in his car driving to work. And then eventually he started making philosophy videos, which is how I found him. And then at some point he turned to doing information type videos. Like he would compile the truth of the truth of the Catholic Church, the truth of, you know, any, just all kinds of stuff. And they did a bunch of psychology videos like the bomb in the brain, which was good. Uh, series. They did a bunch of video series and other ones like that. Parenting videos, no spanking videos, and he was an anarchist for a while. But then he started, I'm not sure quite when it, it changed. He did a bunch of debates and he kind of got beaten up. So maybe this is when it changed. So he kind of moved out of philosophy. He did, he wrote a bunch of books. I actually have a couple of them They're from a long time ago. Um, University Preferable Behavior and Truth, Tyranny of Illusion, something like that. I found his books to be very pedestrian. They're not academic. They're very, like, they're almost like if you, if you're having a conversation, you would just write that. That's his books. It's just people just talking and having a conversation about stuff. Um, so, but anyways, at some point, he just switched to doing facts and information type videos not philosophy videos and he, that's where all that truth of stuff true news and the truth about and, and then the the trump movement hit and he was doing all kinds of videos about trump and some people are like uh weren't you an anarchist and weren't you and there, actually there's someone who's been making videos critiquing molyneux because he's kind of changed his it seems to that he's changed his views now and people are wondering you used to be a guy, you used to be an anarchist, and you used to say that political power is a waste of time. And he even got a lot of flack when he critiqued Ron Paul. Uh, because a lot of people, of course, liked Ron Paul, and they thought he would do well back in was that 2008 or 12? Whenever the Ron Paul movement hit. I'm not sure it was 2012. It must have been 2012, 2008. And, but he critiqued the Ron Paul movement, said it was a waste of time, and that we... You shouldn't go out and vote. And, and then, you know, fast forward to 2015 and 16, now he's a you know, he's big pro-Trump, <laughs> which is kind of odd. But so I'm not sure what he's going to do now because that's all over with. So what is Molyneux going to do now? I'm not sure. So that's why I put him in the information category. He does good videos compiling histories and, and kind of uh, shoveling through the the misinformation of the mainstream media, which is good content, but it's not philosophy. It's not what he used to do. And so I'm just curious, what what is he going to do now? Is he just going to ride this out, or is he different now? He's going to he's just going to do these uh, information type videos now. So I don't know. We'll see. So another good information uh, channel is the Rebel Media. So like I was saying, they used to be the 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 big the original people of Rebel Media came from Sun News in Canada. They were a channel on TV, and they didn't do very well. They were basically, some people called them Fox News North. They were a conservative TV channel, which is rare and unique for Canada because there isn't really a conservative um, news up here. We have the CBC, which is basically like the BBC in Britain. And it is a government-funded news organization. It's it says that it's uh, arm's length, but it's biased. It's left left-wing biased. So they're very complicit in in some things, and you can you can tell they're not fair and balanced. That's for sure. It's kind of like the CNN. CNN's disgraced themselves because of the um, how much bias has been in their media for the Trump election. All of that stuff about. Trump not having a chance, and oh, isn't it obvious that Trump will get that Trump will lose and Clinton will get in? That was all mainstream media bias, and they're getting crunched for it now, which is a good thing. I think a lot of them are losing money, and they might not even exist in six months. Um, listen, the New York Times, I think, is doing awful. I think they're probably going to sink. Twitter is trying to get a buyout. Like it's just Facebook has been doing very well, but um, I guess they're probably maybe the only ones doing well. So anyways, um, Rebel Media came out of the Sun News. So Ezra Levant and Brian Lilly, they're the two original guys from Sun News. And then they made the Rebel Media. 
And again, it did start. It basically started in Ezra LeVant's living room, I guess. And then he expanded and he was doing well. And eventually he made members only content. You have to pay for that. I don't pay for that, but some people do, of course. Um, and he used to have his, um, he, he did a fundraising campaign to get this, his studio and then he got the studio and they used a green screen and then they do like a, almost like they were still on Sun News. But then they expanded to more people, like Gavin McGinnis joined them. Gavin McGinnis is famous for his, used to be with Vice magazine, I think. Now Vice is some left, like, gawker, although gawker, I think, is gone now, because they he, they got sued for millions of dollars by Hulk Hogan. <laughs> I think that's the one, was it gawker? I think that, that's the one that got destroyed, which is a good thing. Uh, but anyways, um, so they added people like Gavin McGinnis, who's, who's big... And I think Gavin McGinnis has most of their views. Probably probably um, a little more than half of all the Rebel Media's views come from Gavin McGinnis' videos. He does fabulously well. There's also someone uh, named Lauren Southern who does very well on uh, Rebel Media. She's from BC. She was a, She's a student. Uh, she was a political science student or something. I don't know why people go into political science. Uh, I guess Ben Shapiro actually think, finished a degree and then he went to law school. But Lauren Southern, I think, quit her university, or maybe she finished. And now she moved to Toronto, and now she's doing full-time stuff for a media. And they have a bunch of other people, too. Some of them were in India lately, covering some UN thing. But they're good. They're an, um, an alternative media source. And I think in the days of the Internet, and the days of finally a realization that mainstream media is biased and can't be trusted, People need to do their own homework, and they need to look at alternative media. And when everyone has a camera in their pocket on their cell phones, and anyone can can record uh, the police, they can record anything they want, really in public, right? You've got extra sources of of media now. You don't have to depend on the local news station to get around to uh, reporting on something or even depending on them to select certain things to report on, we uh, now you can get content on basically anything because so many more sources of information is now available. So this is the, the internet has really led, I think, to the end of uh, mainstream media. And I think less and less people are even paying for cable. Less and less people have TV. They just watch Netflix or they watch YouTube. They don't pay for cable. They don't flip through channels. That's Our parents did that, not us. So this is a new era now for information technology and entertainment. And it's all online on the Internet now. So the mainstream media no longer has, has their monopoly. They no longer have a captive audience, just like the radio at one point. Radio had our grandparents as a captive audience. You might know that H.G. Wells, who's a sci-fi writer, he was reading his um, book called, uh, what's it called, The Mars Attack or something like that. And um, he was reading it on the radio, and people thought it was real. They thought the Earth was being invaded, because that's what the book's about, the Martian invasion of the Earth. But that was on the radio. Uh, what was I talking about? Um, yeah, so at one point, the radio had the copy of audience of the newspaper, probably before the radio really was a newspaper. Then it was the radio, then it was TV, and the, the 9 o'clock news or 6 o'clock news. My, even my dad still watches the 6 o'clock news uh, right on 6 o'clock, right? Uh, but my generation and the young, even the millennial generation, they're not watching TV. It's just for their news and information. There's just no way. It's a new source now. So as much you can look at over time, the sources of news have expanded. The newspapers, the radio, the TV, which has, of course, more channels. Newspapers or, or radio has more d dials or whatever than the newspapers. So now we have the Internet, and the Internet is huge, of far more sources than the uh, 9 o'clock news or 6 o'clock news. So this is the area of, of alternative media, and that means that there's um, more sources, and it means that the truth is out there. It's no longer, uh, you're no longer dependent on mainstream media for delivering it because they don't. But it also means that there's all kinds of fake news and 
clickbait stuff. So there's some responsibility needed today. There's more information, but there's also that the quality of information is not necessarily any better. But the point is that the truth is out there. It just has to be found. So Rebel Media is part of that, I guess. All right, some other information type channels. So Aaron Clary is a rough, rough guy, but he does a lot of videos on very practical questions like jobs and education. And I guess he's some kind of consultant, although I don't know what he's doing because he'll get up at, I don't know, 10 o'clock and he's got a bedhead and he'll do a video. Someone will write him. And I'll do a video about, like, should I join the army or something, whatever. So I don't know where he gets his information from. And I don't think he always knows what he's talk, talking about. But he's got a lot of content on practical questions, which I think are worthwhile. So he's a good information source. But you just have to, not everything he talks about, I think, is his expertise. Another good one is Karen Strawn, who is part of the anti-feminist movement. And she's done a few university talks um, and also been interviewed by a bunch of the other people I've already mentioned. So she has some good content. She runs a podcast called, which I don't think is very good, um, called, uh, what is it, Honey Badger Radio. <laughs> it's um, It's... Not that great, but um, Karen Strawn is good, and she has a few viral videos talking about the disposable mail, which is very good. No, it's funny. When there is something that goes too extreme or too prominent, there's always a counter movement. So when feminism has gone out of control, that's when you get the rise of a counter movement. Even the election of Trump. It's just an example of a counter force, a reactionary force. When people are pissed off of an eight years of the Democrats and Obama, and when the working class think they're being screwed by Democrats that care about them only every four years, um, you get a reaction. And I think that Karen Strawn is an example of a reaction to, to uh, a feminism that's gone beyond its. Feminism is really ne needed in other parts of the world, not in the West. And that's something that feminism has been unable to defend, and rightly so. Uh, they, for some reason, because they're part of the left, they'll defend, for example, cultures that deprave women. And so you, you wonder, are you really, is, are feminists really about women, or are they about left-wing politics? And then it becomes quite clear what the real agenda is. So anyways, Karen Strawn is fantastic on feminism. Um, okay, Sargon of Akkad, of course, is quite well known. He does commentary videos and on just on anything, really, mostly about social justice warrior stuff, but he's in Britain. So he's, I guess, a counter to Thunderfoot, although I don't think they've ever spoken to each other. But that would be interesting, because Aragon's more of a libertarian, whereas Thunderfoot's a more typical um, left-wing, uh, more-money-for-me kind of type. Uh, but Sargon is at least a libertarian in some respects. So, But he's got a lot. He's basically a social justice warrior guy. But he does a lot of good videos that are, I think are good uh, information on what's been going on. But not as deep. I don't put him in the intellectual category. I don't think he goes as deep as some other people. There's also, of course, information. But again, like I said, you have to be wary of what you're reading and looking at. Once in a while, like I guess, actually, the only really time I've looked at this, I, I'll mention the source, Infowars and Paul Joseph Watson's stuff. The only time I've really looked at their stuff is during the Trump election because the mainstream media was obviously corrupt. So I was just curious, okay, what? What's going on over here? Uh, what are the when when one source is corrupt, then the other people will tend to to jump in and show the truth. So, Infowars has some good stuff. Uh, some of it is is bad. Like every now and then they talk about devils and demons, like just like Orini does, and it's nonsense. Um, 
there's one person on there also, Roger Stone, who is, I guess, wrote a book on the Clintons. And Christopher Hitchens wrote a book on the Clintons, don't forget that. So the Clintons have a long history of corruption, I think. And the foundation, I think, is a money laundering scheme for, for um, well, those appointments and those emails. I think we'll probably find that out quite soon. Um, I think the Russians probably have our emails, which is kind of funny. But anyways, um, so Roger Stone talks about that kind of stuff. But then he looks like a goof. Uh, well, the last video that he did with Stefan Molyneux, he's got these welding goggles on. I have no idea why. And in other videos, he's got like gangster hats. I don't know what they're called, but those white hats with the with the um, ribbon around them. It's just weird. It's just a weird guy. But anyways, um, during the Trump uh, during that night, what was it? Tuesday. It was a Tuesday night. I was um, I watched the whole thing, and I was watching the uh, Infowars. Um, some of it. I was watching some of the Infowars broadcast during that night, uh, and watching the states, the various states change, and um, watching Florida and ninety nine percent on the New York Times map for a while. And, but anyways, um, it was a good it was a good night, and as soon as I saw that. Uh, what was it? Was it Ohio and Florida? As soon as I saw that Ohio and Florida were flipping, I was I knew it was over. I knew that, that Trump was winning this. And I just maybe I should mention that quickly. Um I always thought it was suspicious because I know the mainstream media and the general attitude was that Trump had net doesn't have a chance. And this is just gonna be a Clinton win. But I had watched some of Trump's rallies, and there is no way that the rallies and the polls were consistent. There's no way that Trump can visit a city, sometimes a Democrat uh, state, sometimes a blue state, and he would get thousands of people um, attending his rallies. And then you look at Clinton, and she would rent out a high school gym and get a few hundred people, <laughs> mostly probably people bust, labor unions that were busted, you know how it is. Uh, labor unions are, and then of course you've seen the O'Keefe videos, then now it all makes sense that the DNC were actually paying people to to protest Trump rallies and start fights, and it's you know, just crazy. But um, anyways, uh, I knew that was inconsistent, and there's actually a website too you can look at. You can uh, look up rally attendance, and Trump did three times the number of rallies that Clinton did. And Trump got on average thousands of people and Clinton got hundreds. Apparently, there was a rally that Tim Kaine did, and he got like 50 people showing up. <laughs> just, just, so when I was watching that kind of stuff, I knew that this support for Trump it could not be consistent with the polls. The only way they could be consistent, I was thinking, was that Trump supporters are very enthusiastic for Trump, but Clinton supporters are not. And they don't, they'll, while they might vote for Clinton, they're not going to go to one of her rallies. They don't care that much. But then I also noticed that near the end, Clinton was getting really desperate and she started having celebrities. So then I, I was thinking, well, this, this, is, she must be afraid. So I, anyways, I knew that there was a discrepancy, but I didn't know what to expect that night. But I knew there was a discrepancy. The, the rally attendance that was not consistent with the polls. And rally attendance, of course, is reality. And polls are what? I actually heard that um, a lot of polls still use landlines. Who the hell has a landline under 30 today? I don't know a single person with a landline. I know one person who has an internet phone. But I don't know a single person with a landline, uh, like other than parents. I don't know a single person, other than older people, I don't know a single person with a landline. I don't have a landline. So they're cutting out a, a, a lot of people. So anyways, um, all right, where was I? So InfoWars, okay. Oh yeah, PragerU, I think I mentioned PragerU already, but PragerU does very good videos on topics on uh, the minimum wage or on abortion or on just topics like that. Millions of views are very well produced and they're worth looking up. 
I, I wish the, uh, there's what's called the Ayn Rand Institute. They have a basically a non-existent presence on YouTube, which is unfortunate. But I wish they would do PragerU videos because they do very well. The format is excellent. And they get lots of views and lots of commentary. And that's always good. Because if you show someone a video, then even if they disagree with the video, at least at least they've seen another point of view, even if they don't understand it. And at least they also know that other people disagree with them and other people have coherent points that they must, they, they should uh, know about. Otherwise, how can they possibly know their own position? I think that was a quote from, um, who is it? John Stuart Mill? Ben Benjamin Franklin. I think it might have been Benjamin Franklin who said that if you don't know your opponent's view, you know little of your own point of view, which is, of course, obviously, how could you possibly arrive at a conclusion without alternatives? It doesn't, it's, it's an uneducated, you are not educated unless you know the points of view of people you disagree with and you can argue for their point of view. If you don't, if you can't, if you just think that they're a racist or something like that, you're not educated. You've been, I don't know, you're part of some radical group probably, right? And that's tiresome. And I see it all the time. That won't be anyone watching this video, but. Okay, so just a few mentionable uh, mentionables. Um,